Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Power Is Now. My name is Eric Frazier. Thank you for joining me this evening. It's Tuesday night, and it's time for The Power Is Now First Time Home Buyer Seminar. We're live on Block Talk Radio, and we'll be going shortly uh, to Facebook Live. I want to invite those of you who are on Block Talk Radio to check us out on Facebook. That's where we are every Tuesday afternoon and Tuesday evening to talk about real estate. And tonight we're going to be talking about the power budget. So I enjoy coming on the radio and also on Facebook uh, to talk about these very important issues. And what I love about uh, Facebook and Block Talk Radio is that it is on demand, radio on demand. And so those of you who are listening live right now, I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to join me this evening. We're going to be going live in just a few minutes uh, to facebook.com. And I want to encourage those of you who are listening live on Block Talk Radio to go to facebook.com forward slash the power is now. And there you can see me and hear me. Also, please share the link, like us on, on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube. A lot of great information that we are sharing each and every week on Facebook and on uh, Block Talk Radio. So while we're setting up, um, we're going live right now to Facebook. Please stand by. Okay, we're getting ready to go live on Facebook. This is Eric Frazier and with the Power Is Now Radio, we're live on Facebook and on Blog Talk Radio. For those of you who are watching us live on Facebook, please contact us via phone. We can have a conversation over the telephone as well as in the chat room on Facebook. The telephone number is 323-843-6082. That's 323-843-6082. Well, tonight is our weekly Power Is Now First Time Home Buyer Seminar. Earlier this afternoon, we had the Power Lunch between 12.30 and 1.30, and we had the privilege of having Lacey Robinson on to talk about the PACE program. And so I want to encourage you to listen and or watch the interview I did with Lacey, where she really shared some great information about the PACE program and, and what's happening out there. Uh, one particular example is an elderly man purchasing, uh, not purchasing, but paying almost 250000 plus to have a new roof put on his 3,000 square foot house in Los Angeles and paint. Um, after negotiations and complaints, uh, it was reduced to 100000 and but still it's way too much money to put on a new roof and to paint a home. And so there's a lot of fraud happening with the PACE program. For those of you who are first time home buyers or you own your home right, 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 right now and you're thinking about buying a home, please talk to a real estate professional first or a mortgage professional. Give me a call before you sign anything. There may be another way to get you the energy efficiency you're looking for. And I can tell you that uh, so far what I'm seeing PACE may not be the right answer for you, especially if it's going to overcharge you for the work that you need to do to get your home up to speed. 
So listen to the interview. Uh, it was earlier today at 12.30. You can find it on Facebook, and you can also find it on the Power Is Now Blog Talk Radio. So uh, for those of you who are just now tuning in or learning about the, first, uh, the Power Is Now for the first time, uh, let me share some information about us. We are a media company that began in uh, August of 2009, and we've been going strong ever since. If you go to our website, thepowersnow.com, you'll find that we have a magazine. In fact, check out the uh, June issue where we celebrate Juneteenth. We also have an online television program. You can find us on YouTube. Please subscribe to us on YouTube and also here on Facebook. Like us on Facebook. And then uh, we do live events like tonight and earlier today. And then we'll be doing another one on uh, Thursday called the Powers Now Marketing Session. Uh, in addition to being a media company and really focused as a media company on education, uh, financial literacy, homeownership, wealth building through real estate, we are a real estate company and a mortgage company. You know, why not uh, provide the means by which people can put this knowledge to use, right? And so the Power Is Now Inc. does business as the Power Is Now Real Estate Services, licensed only in the state of California. Our license number is 198407. We're also doing business as the Power Is Now Mortgage Services, licensed only in the state of California, and our NMLS license number is 143243. I am the broker for both the Power Is Now Mortgage Services and the Power Is Now Real Estate Services. My individual license number for the Power Is Now Real Estate Services is 01143484, and my individual license number for the Power Is Now Mortgage Services is NMLS license number 461807. The power is now. We are here to support you, to help you achieve the American dream of homeownership. In fact, that's our slogan. We make the American dream of homeownership a reality. And we do it through online platforms to educate and to inspire. And we have the companies to provide the support and the means to make homeownership a reality, to acquire the loan you need that fits your unique situation. One of the, um, I would say, the most unique things about the powers now is that we, as a mortgage broker, never say no. We may say not right now, but we will never say no because there is a loan program for everyone. Now, I was a banker with Wells Fargo. Uh, with Washington Mutual, with American Savings, Home Savings of America, First Interstate Bank. I've been a banker for 36 years, and so I know firsthand the limitations that banks have. When I became a mortgage broker, it just opened my world to all kinds of programs and products that can help people buy a home. And so, so many people are scared to even go into the bank because they fear they're going to be turned down. And you know, the fears are justified. Uh, there's a huge percentage, a very large percentage of minorities who, will, who are declined every month, every year for a conventional loan. Typically the only types of loans they're able to get, better than 70% of minorities when they're buying a home are using an FHA loan. Now I love FHA, don't get me wrong, but it has mortgage insurance, it's very expensive. And if there's a way you can get around mortgage insurance, you ought to do it. But if you can't, better to pay the mortgage insurance, get into the game and become a homeowner and then work on your credit, save some money and try to refinance out of it later on. And so we are making the dream of homeownership a reality because even with FHA, where the underwriting guidelines are much more flexible, even with FHA, people are getting turned down by banks because they have credit overlays. They, they make the debt ratio much lower than it than actually is required to be. They make the FICO score much higher than it's actually required to be by Congress who sets the underwriting guidelines for HUD. And so as a mortgage broker, I have the ability to find and work with lenders that don't have the credit overlays, overlays that don't require the, have the additional requirements that are really serious and committed about helping first time home buyers get into homes. And I tell you, especially here in California, uh, recent statistics showed that great, more than 50% of Californians have most of their homeownership and most of their income going out to housing. 50% of their income is going out to housing. 
And so how do you save money to buy a house? You know, and when you are able to save money to buy a house, you need probably some flexibility, you need some help in making that happen. And uh, more flexible underwriting guidelines is what's needed. Every day I come across people who are paying $2,000, $2,500, $3,000 in rent. And that equals just about what you would pay to purchase a three hundred dollars to $400,000 house. And so you have to find a way to buy. You really do. You have to find a way to buy. And uh, that's a weed every day. In fact, that's my job. I wake up in the morning thinking about how I can help someone get into a home. What new lender I need to bring on the platform. What new, uh, what lender I may need to go and fight with to, to represent and advocate for my client to get that loan approved. And so that's what the power is now is all about. And that's why we do this uh, Tuesday night, uh, first time home buyer seminars. It's at seven o'clock at night, pretty late, right? But we know you're working. And so we try to make it uh, so it's uh, available uh, for everyone to tune in and to get the information you need. Well, folks, uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen for a moment here because we're going to um, talk about tonight the power budget, the power budget. And the power budget is just a great, uh, I would say, uh, having a power budget is a great way to get into homeownership much faster than perhaps you have been doing before. If you don't have a budget, then that may be the reason why you don't own a home right now. And many people are in that position because they haven't saved money, they haven't really been managing their credit, they have you know, all kinds of challenges going on. And it's, a, it's affecting their ability to save money to be able to own a home. And so it, that may be you, that may be you, uh, and it may not be you. But tonight I'm gonna give you some tools and some uh, resources uh, to help you uh, create a power budget. Now, you might ask, well, what is a power budget? A power budget is a budget that empowers you to save money to eliminate debt and to become a homeowner. That's what a power budget is. It enables you to save money, eliminate debt, and to buy a home. That's what it does, a power budget. Show me a person with, I don't know, a budget, and I'll show you a person with money in the bank. Show me a person with a budget, and I'll show you a person with good credit. Show me a person uh, with a budget, and I'll show you a person that probably doesn't have a lot of debt. And I think the power of budget, or having a budget, whatever you want to call it in general, is a powerful tool to keep you on track, to help you become a homeowner, to help you to achieve your financial goals. And so I have a uh, presentation uh, that I'm going to uh, share on the screen in just a minute here. Uh, this power budget is, uh, is a PowerPoint presentation, but it is also uh, a book. And it's a book that will be coming out very, very soon, uh, which gets in much more detail on budgeting. And so we certainly hope that you will take advantage of it uh, and uh, buy the book when it's available. So I will let you know when the power budget is uh, ready to go. Uh, and it will be available at Amazon and also on the Power Is Now uh, bookstore. So for those of you who are, you know, you've been living on a budget, you're ready to go, and um, you, it's, you, you think, Eric, okay, it sounds great, I'll listen, but, you know, I'm ready now. Um, here's what you can do. You can go and get started right now. Just go to applytobuynow.com, applytobuynow.com, or you can call me. Uh, and I will take your application over the phone. Uh, we folks, we really work seven days a week. Uh, I have six days right here, but we are available to assist you. Uh, you can go to Never Rent Again uh, if you need help, neverrentagain.com. We have a special program uh, for people who are not ready just now and uh, just yet. They need to get established on a budget. They need to eliminate some debt. They need to improve their FICO score. Um, they need help. And so we provide financial coaching uh, to help you get on track. It's a one-time meeting, which we set you up on everything. And I'm telling you, in that, in that hour, 
we will have you completely set up with a plan, uh, with a budget and everything you need. Uh, it only takes about an hour, maybe an hour and a half at the most. Then once that's set up, now you're on your own. Uh, and we will encourage you, we will help you, but you have to be disciplined. You've got to stick to the plan. Now, if you can't do that, then we have another program. It's a paid program where you sign up for a coach and we hold you accountable every single month to the goals that we've set for you. So it's called Never Rent Again. Please go to neverrentagain.com and learn more about the program. So the question is, do you have a budget? Do you have a budget? You know, if you don't have a budget, that is an indication of a problem. It really is. Uh, before you can have a budget, you, you have to be able to keep a promise uh, to yourself because that's what happens. You know, it's like diets. People go into diets and they, um, they keep falling off the diet, falling off the wagon, right? And they start over and they keep having to start over and they never ever lose any weight because they can't stick to a plan and they can't keep a promise, a promise to themselves. And so we know what a promise is, right? It's, it's, a, it's a commitment, it's a statement saying that you're definitely going to do something and that you really mean it, that it's definitely going to happen in the future. Why? Because you're prepared to be all in uh, and, and to do whatever it takes to make it happen. And so that's really what a budget is. It's a promise to yourself to save money, to eliminate debt, to stop overspending, to do all those things, which is just robbing you of the opportunity to buy a home. So let me go back here. I'm losing control of my PowerPoint. <laughs> so a budget is, uh, again, very important. And uh, we need to have a budget that's smart. First of all, it has to include a mission and a vision statement. And so kind of have kind of roadmap is what a mission and vision statement is. It's a roadmap, a general roadmap of where you see yourself as a vision statement in the future. And as a mission statement, who are you? And what are you doing day to day to achieve your goals? And so I think you can't start any plan. You can't start a business plan without a mission and a vision statement. You can't start an exercise plan without a mission and a vision statement. You can't start a diet plan without a mission and a vision statement, you really cannot. You gotta know who you are and you gotta know where you're going. That's what a mission statement is, who you are, what you're all about on a day-to-day -day basis, and a vision statement, where you're going. You also need SMART goals, SMART goals. And SMART is an acronym for those of you who have gone to business school, you already know what I'm gonna talk about. Specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. That's what SMART, it's an acronym. Each letter stands for something very, very important as it relates to goal setting. Also, you have to have an accountability partner. And I tell you, that's where a lot of people fall down. In fact, people we set up on our Never Been Again program, our, our coaching program, they keep it for a week or two, they fall off. And it's kind of interesting because they fall off the plan, they stop following the plan, uh, and they know that they're not following the plan because they're not being held accountable. And they don't want to be held accountable, right? But they know they need to be held accountable. And so what do you do? Well, you hire a coach. Well, coaches aren't free, they cost money. So they're not willing now to pay money for someone else's time to hold them accountable. And so, you, you know, when you think about it, this person is almost a lost cause. They have to come to grips with their weaknesses, kind of where they're at and decide either they're going to invest in themselves, get a coach, hold themselves accountable, or they're going to reset, start again, and hold themselves accountable and, uh, and keep doing it until they can get it right. So whatever your situation might be, you know where you fall into that. You may need an accountability partner. We're going to talk about that. And then sometimes to achieve goals, we got to break them down. And so uh, we have what is called a weekly Big Five Action Plan. And that Big Five Action Plan is five days of the week, you know, breaking it down. Uh, an annual goal can break down to a quarterly goal, which breaks down to a monthly goal, which breaks down to a weekly goal, 
which breaks down to a daily goal. And you can even break it down to the eight hours you have, eight to 10 hours you have every single day uh, to work on your goals. And ultimately what you have is then a power is now budget plan, a power budget. And that's what we're gonna start with today. So let's get right to it. Uh, the first thing is a mission and vision statement. And as I stated earlier, a mission statement is who you are. You know, who are you or who you want to be? Uh, sometimes a mission statement can be who you want to be, but don't get that mixed up with the vision statement, right? You can talk about who you are, but if you don't really like who you are, you can also talk about who you are trying to be, all right? And so um, this mission statement can be very short, it can be very long, but it needs to be about who you are and what you're doing to achieve your goals. And so I place an example of a mission statement that you could use. It may not be representative of you, uh, maybe it will be, but uh, this mission statement is, I am a believer, uh, a husband, a father, son, and a brother. And what I like about that first statement is that, you know, we, we are, you know, we're very complex creatures. We're spiritual, right? You know, we believe in God or some higher power. We believe that we're not alone, right? Um, and we then have relationships we have, we're husbands, we're fathers, we're sons, we're brothers, we're daughters. You know, I should include daughters in there. That's all in the male uh, context. But, you know, who are you in your relationships, right? Who are you? And uh, so I think that that's a great way to start a mission statement. And then to get into not just who you are, but what do you do? So I work, you know, that's a good thing to have a job, right? <laughs> I work every day to provide for my family. And so we got to go from provisions, working, bringing in on the break-in to take care of the family, but we got to move beyond, you know, uh, just the basics. We don't want to stay at, at, at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We've got to go beyond that to building wealth for the future, being able to leave an inheritance and a legacy. And that's something that I, I believe that we don't think about until we get much older in life. And the time to think about that, those things is right now. And then to get even more specific about what you do, because a mission statement, it says, I save 20% of my monthly earnings. I use credit for convenience, only to avoid uh, carrying cash. So we're not carrying a cash. And we, if we use credit, it's because we're not carrying cash. So we're not using credit to make large purchases and go into a lot of debt. I'm building an emergency fund. Everybody can count on an emergency fund. You know, there's two things, uh, three things that, uh, that you have to count on in life. One, pay taxes. You're gonna to have to pay taxes. Two, die. We're all gonna die unless the Lord Jesus comes and catches some of us who are alive. And then three, something's gonna happen where you're gonna need money. <laughs> now you might be able to add to that, but let me tell you something. You can't live on this earth too long. Even as a little baby, I have a grandson that's two months old. I'm telling you right now, you're not long on this earth before something is going to happen that requires some extraordinary measure, right? It just, it's just life. And so are you prepared for that? Are you prepared for emergency fund equal to 12 months of your income? You know, uh, many people lost their jobs during the great financial crisis and they had to go without work for a long time. There are people who've been in major car accidents, broke both legs and arms and or, you know, they, something happened that really set them back for a long period of time. Are you prepared to deal with extraordinary circumstances? The next sentence, I plan my vacations and spending. I do not eat out except for special occasions. We all know eating out just robs you of the money uh, savings. I'm disciplined, I'm frugal, I live modesty, modestly. I do not flaunt what I have obtained, so you're conservative. You're not just spending money to be spending money, say, hey, look what I bought. I practice humility and giving to others. I'm focused on building stability uh, and stability, building stability for my family and being in a position to help others whenever needed. So that's an example of a mission statement, folks, that anyone can use. I highly recommend it. Now, the next one is a vision statement. And again, a vision statement is what you plan to achieve. You know, where do you see yourself five years from now? And by the way, yes, for some of you who may be just tuning in, I'm not talking about a business plan, I'm talking about a budget plan, right? But it's interesting, as I stated before, every plan 
requires a mission and a vision statement. And so here's another example. I will save $100, $1,000, $10,000, $50,000, $100,000, $1,000,000. You pick the number in cash for retirement and own my home free and clear of any mortgage debt. All right, now I think that's a great way to start off with where you see yourself years from now. I mean, debt free. That ought to be everyone's goal is to get debt free. Because as long as you owe something on it, somebody can take it from you. All right, I don't care what it is, car, house, even the jewelry on your hands and, and feet, you know, <laughs> or neck, uh, they can take it. If it's being financed, it can be confiscated. So I, I am or will be completely debt free and retire at the age of 65. It doesn't have to be 65, it could be 55, it could be 45. With dignity and set an example for my children to do the same, my children will have their college education paid for by me and also own a home. And so that could be a goal for you as a parent that you're gonna take care of your kids' education and you're going to provide them the down payment. Maybe if you're really doing well, you can buy their home. My grandchildren will have access to funds to pay for their education and to help them purchase their first home. Man, isn't that a great goal to have? When I leave this earth, okay, now we're talking about real estate planning here, because again, we're not gonna live forever. I will have left an inheritance and have begun a legacy of wealth building that will continue to the next generation. Now folks, these are mission and vision statements that uh, are designed to just to give you an idea of what you have there. But if you don't have a mission statement, if you don't have a, a vision statement for your budget, then uh, you're just, you're, you're not gonna make it. I'm just telling you now, you're not gonna make it. Uh, it's not sustainable. You, uh, you know, your mind will, your body will follow your mind. Your actions will follow your mind. You've gotta, we've gotta set the right expectations. We have to have the right mindset. We have to think correctly. We have to see it before we will honestly do it. We have to see it and believe it. And so that's the power in writing mission statements and vision statements. Write them down, put them on the wall, share them with your family and your friends. Um, be really serious about it. And I promise you will not regret it. All right. The next is SMART goals. The SMART goal is important because, I mean, we all set goals, don't we? I mean, who doesn't set goals? Every single person I know sets goals. It's part of life, every aspect of life, you know? I mean, I have a goal. Even tonight, I have a goal. I have a goal to end this show at 8 o'clock. I may not end this show at 8 o'clock, but that's at least my goal. <laughs> we all have goals. Everything comes down to priorities. And, and what you accomplish, everything. Goals are decisions. They are a conscious, rational decision, rational choice. It's a subconscious preference. You know, it's in the back of your mind exactly what you want to do, how you want to achieve it. And life without goals is a series of chaotic happenings you don't control. And who wants to live like that? Seriously, do you want to live like that? I don't want to live like that, where I'm just constantly reacting to everything, right? Who wants to live like that? And that's what happens when you don't have goals and you don't have plans. You're just constantly reacting to everything because you're not singularly focused on what you're doing and you don't really have a plan. You become the plaything of coincidence instead of a vision that your own vision that you are trying to put into reality, that you're trying to make a reality. And you can do it, but it starts with, you know, having a SMART goal. So this is the breakdown of a SMART goal. S stands for specific, it means the more specific you are in your description, the bigger the, the chance, the better the chance you'll get the goal, you'll achieve it. And so uh, instead of saying, you know, I'm going to, in sales, you know, we can say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to close $50 million this year. Okay, well, do you really know what that means? I mean, does it, well, that might mean, if I, that may mean, a, 
that may be that may mean a hundred transactions based on your average loan amount or average purchase price, or two hundred transactions or three hundred transactions, and that may mean then if you break that down by the year, over twenty to thirty transactions a month or ten to twenty or thirty transactions a month. Now you keep breaking it down until you get down to how many transactions you need to have every hour or every few hours or every day. And then when you can see what you have to do on a daily basis, then it becomes real and you have to make adjustments in your activities. You have to really revisit, uh, you know, your, your goals and the expectations so that they are realistic. And we're going to get to that in a minute, but that's that's the benefit of breaking the goals down into very small steps and being really specific about it. And when you do that, guess what happens? They become they become measurable. Measurable goals mean that you identify exactly what you will see, hear, and feel when you reach the goal. You can actually see the goal coming to fruition, coming to uh, to be, because you've broken it down into specific measurable steps. And then guess what happens? You, if you realize it's actually attainable and you get excited about your goals. You know, you, you realize that not only can you do it, I mean, but, but you see you see the plan and you see how it's going to come together. And that's something, it's something you really want. And that's what happens sometimes when we break things down and we see what we got to do to achieve these things, we then have to ask ourselves, well, do I really want to do that? You know, do I really want to put forth this effort? Um, is this really a priority for me in my life? I mean, um, you, you really can't even ask yourself those kinds of questions until you break it down and it's measurable then you're able to see that it is attainable. The next thing is relevant. Why do you want to reach the goal? How does this fit in the, game, in the grand scheme of your life, in your profession, in your family, you know? And then time bound. Time is money, right? So are you prepared to make the investment in time, which is money? Everybody knows that deadlines are what makes people uh, move into action. You know, uh, when you tell somebody that you want something done, always to include by when, right? <laughs> I, I try to practice this in managing my own business. When I ask someone to do something, I don't say, you know, uh, Bella, can you do this? I, I try to say, Bella, I need you to call Mr. So-and-so and I need you to do it before 12. Or I, 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 you know, I'll come up with uh, something that I need someone to do Rayla, I need you to go pick up my clothes at the cleaners and the cleaner closes at five. So I need you to get down there before five, right? Now, if I didn't give her specific instructions, she might think it's okay to go at six and they're closed and I don't have my clothes. It just, you know, the more specific you get, uh, the more with the time, uh, the better odds are you're going to achieve the goal. Uh, there's this book called uh, The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins. And what, um, what gets her to move forward to do whatever it is she doesn't want to do is counting down. You know, she doesn't want to go to the gym and she's just, she keeps turning over the clock and, and pulling the covers over her head, doesn't want to give up, get up at five o'clock in the morning. She has to start counting down from five, five, four, three, two, one, and she automatically gets up and gets dressed and gets out there. And there's something going on in the mind uh, as it relates to time that uh, puts you into action when you put a deadline or a timeline or a clock on it. Uh, so install deadlines for yourself, meet the deadlines. When are you going to get it done? The power is now. And when you don't put a, um, a deadline on it, all you do is you set yourself up uh, to making excuses. That's what you do. You set yourself up making excuses about not getting it done. And uh, uh, no one really wants to hear an excuse. You know, have you ever let somebody down? Isn't it, what's worse, letting them down or making an excuse about letting them down? 
I say making an excuse is even worse than letting them down. If you let someone down, you're just better off, you know, owning it and apologize and just say, I am never going to do this again. I'm on it, right? You let someone down and then you make an excuse about letting them down. I think that's even worse. Stop making excuses, set smart goals, get it done, no excuses. The other thing that I think is uh, very powerful when it comes to goal setting is having an accountability partner. And uh, for a lot of people, having an accountability partner is, uh, is challenging because you know, they are adults and they don't really want to be accountable to anybody. I mean, <laughs> who wants to be accountable? Uh, I mean, we can all admit that um, you know, one of the great things about you know, being an adult is that you have freedom to do what you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it, right? And unfortunately, that can work against us. It didn't work against us when we were children and our parents were managing us and monitoring our every move and telling us what to do all the time. But as a result of that, we made it through grade school, high school, college, uh, and stayed out of trouble. And, you know, we're living, you know, probably our best life right now. We owe it to the supervision of our parents. And, uh, but as soon as we left that supervision, some people got into big trouble uh, because no one can tell them anything. No one can tell them what to do. And some people are just that way. They, uh, they're just not built to listen to advice, to hear the advice of others, or to be held accountable, or to be willing to make themselves accountable to others. The only way they learn is through pain and suffering and heartache and disappointment. That's that's their, uh, that, those are their disciplines. Pain, heartache, suffering, disappointment. Um, that's how they learn. It's a, it's a proverbial school of hard knots. And many people are graduates of that school, summa cum laude, uh, PhDs, because they can't be told anything. They don't wanna listen to anyone. Are you that way? If you're that way, uh, raise your hand in Facebook. I won't, I won't, no, no, never mind, don't do that. Don't do that if you're not that way. So one of the great things about an a power, ability, account, a power uh, uh, accountability partner is that um, it will make you more humble and thoughtful. It will. Uh, there's something about being under the uh, authority of another person. You become more humble and you become more thoughtful about your decisions and what you're going to do because your goal is to, you know, respect uh, and to follow the instructions. And no one wants to be looked upon as someone who can't follow instructions or someone who doesn't keep their promises or someone who doesn't have integrity or someone who is not reliable. Who wants to be looked upon that way? Nobody does. And so uh, having uh, an accountability partner will make you more humble and more thoughtful. And so the question is, are you willing to subject yourself to that type of authority, to allow someone to say, do I have permission to hold you accountable to your goals? You know, uh, a good friend of mine, um, uh, his name is Rick Martin. And one of the things he does to me that, you know, whenever he asks this question, uh, I know I'm about to hear something that I don't want to hear, all right? And the question is, do I have permission to be frank with you, to be honest with you? Do I have permission, Eric, to be honest with you, to really read, to just to be really frank with you? Do I have permission? So, uh, of course, <laughs> when someone asks you that, get ready, all right? Because chances are, it's probably not going to be something you want to hear, but it's probably something you need to hear. It's probably something you need to hear. Um, we, uh, I think, are just creatures that we we can, we're blind to our own actions. We're blind to how we, how we look, how we, how we behave, what we say. We don't, we don't really see ourselves. That's, what, that's the power in coaching. Having someone who you trust uh, and can tell you the truth about yourself. As they are invaluable people. They're worth their weight in gold. They are. 
and you're blessed to have someone in your life like that, that can be very honest, direct, and frank with you. So the definition of being accountable is being required to explain your actions or decisions to someone else. Being required to be responsible for not getting the results or achieving the goal. Being responsible. See, when you're accountable, uh, and you're being responsible, then you, that means you can't point to anyone else but yourself. You cannot make excuses, right? When you have to explain why you have to, you, you weren't able to achieve the goal or, 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 or that were set before you, no one wants to hear excuses. They want to know what were the stumbling blocks? What were the challenges that you face that you couldn't overcome? Uh, and the best thing to do instead of lying is to be honest that you didn't have the resolve. You did not have the internal resolve. You, you failed and you lacked the commitment and the integrity to get it done. That's the truth. You really don't have anyone to blame or anyone else. You just simply lacked the integrity, the fortitude, the the, the desire, you really just didn't want to do it, just tell the truth, tell the truth. And um, because again, not telling the truth and making excuses that are really just lies makes it even worse. So accountability partner requires collaboration. If you, the first thing too, by the way, before you, uh, you know, start just picking anybody. You just can't pick anybody, right? Um, I don't recommend your spouse to be your accountability partner, right? I recommend that first you hire a professional, someone who doesn't really care about you. They care about you, but only to the extent that you care about you. So they care about delivering the results, helping you to deliver the results that you want to deliver for yourself. That's what they care about. They don't really care about your feelings. They don't really care about you getting mad. They don't care about you being offended, being held accountable. They don't care about any of those things. See, if you get a brother or sister or a husband or wife or somebody like that, they might care too much about how you feel. And that's the last thing you need uh, because you'll, you'll fall victim to that. And then next thing you know, you're making excuses and, and they're empathizing with you. So I'm telling you right now, I'm using a family member the family members don't make great accountability partners. Now, if you want to get a distant cousin, you know, uh, something like that, that might work, you know, at least uh, very distant, your sixth cousin, <laughs> but a family member that's not gonna work. So find somebody, uh, you may have to pay them, all right? So we have accountability partners here, you have to pay us, uh, we'll be happy to do that, but we're gonna hold you accountable, all right? Now, uh, there are personal, personal coaches, they're very expensive. You can reach out to them. Um, and, or you can just pick someone that you know of. They're not, you're not friends, but explain what you're trying to do. And, um, and perhaps you can hold each other accountable. They have certain goals that they would like to achieve and they need an accountability partner. And you make a commitment to be very honest and frank with each other, not to uh, and, 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 and give permission to just be honest and truthful. So once you got that, then you start to collaborate. You create a budget, a written plan of income and expenses for the week. So your accountability partner is going to help you do that. You'll create a mission and a vision statement, a weekly power plan. That power plan is an activity plan. The things that you have to do, you know, what gets scheduled gets done. I love that statement. What gets scheduled gets done. It really does. And then you meet monthly with your accountability partner to review your plans. Review your plans every single month. Now, in some cases, uh, you know you, you may have to meet weekly uh, to get started here. And then as you are, you know, being uh, true and meeting the goals, you can go weekly to two weeks or three weeks, every four weeks, every 60 days, because you got this thing nailed down and you're making it happen. So the key is, is that you have to have integrity with each other. You've got to be honest with yourself and with your accountability partner at all times. If you're not, then you're just wasting your time. 
and their time too. So a power plan is where the power is. It's the daily action plan. And I, I love the daily action plan uh, because uh, honestly, um, every goal in life can be broken down to a daily activity. It can even be broken down to something you have to do or be mindful of every hour. So each day of the week has important tasks that must be accomplished in order to get done. And you've got to identify what those tasks are and get it done. That's what breaking the goals down. Each action uh, item is assigned to a day of the week to be accomplished. Each action item must be on your calendar. So uh, one thing you want to stop doing if you're really serious about achieving your goals is stop creating to-do lists. They are a waste of paper. They really are. I, I, I used to keep to-do lists. I don't. I keep a calendar. I literally keep a calendar. And I have a great assistant. And so I, I have to know what's next. And, and I have to know what my priorities are. And I have to actually get them scheduled in the day to make sure they get done. And I have to admit that even with that, I still sometimes uh, don't get all the things I want to get done. But that, that happens to all of us. You're not going to get everything you want to get done. But let me tell you what you will get done. You will get done what absolutely needs to get done. All right? That is the challenge. Identifying the absolute priorities. You know, there's a book called The One Thing by Gary Keller. And Gary believes that, that there's really just one thing. There's one thing that you need to do every day, that if you were to do that one thing, everything else would just fall into place. I mean, that one thing carries that much weight. It's based on the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle. And, you know, I have to agree with Gary. I mean, when I, I, could, I can think about, you know, based on my profession, what I do every day, what is, I, I can identify what is the one thing that if I just took care of that every single day, 80% of other things that I, what I would like to see happen, what I need to happen, things that need to get done, would get handled. I believe that. So it's a great book called The One Thing by Gary Keller. I highly recommend you start using it. Stop using to-do lists. Use a calendar. Then you have the weekly Big Five Action Plan. And I love the, the Big Five Action Plan because, you know, at the end of the day, or at the end of the week, you know, you need to be able to look back and say, I have, you know, I'm on track. I'm on track. I have achieved all of my goals for the week, for the day. And you know that you're going to achieve your big five because you achieved everything you were supposed to do on Monday. You achieved everything you're supposed to do on Tuesday. You achieved everything you're supposed to do on Wednesday. You achieved everything you were supposed to do on Thursday and then on Friday, and you're celebrating on Saturday because you nailed it and you are on track. In fact, everything got done by five o'clock. And truthfully, you should say three o'clock. Three o'clock in case you can leave yourself a little lead time in case something, you know, happens and, you know, things do happen and you get delayed. So the, big, the weekly Big Five Action Plan must be in line with your goals for the month, uh, with your goals for the quarter, with your goals for the year. And uh, when it is in line, you will know it. So those are the things you need to have in place. Uh, that's, uh, those are kind of the foundations, getting, a, getting the mission and vision statement together, and then your SMART goals and identifying an activity, uh, an accountability partner. So now let's get into the details, all right? So, the budget details, making money. You know, I have to tell you, uh, if you're not making money, uh, a budget is um, not necessary. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just, that's just the truth. If you're not making enough money, a budget doesn't work. So let me get this right here. So if you're not making money, you don't need a budget. There's nothing to budget. If you're not making enough money, right, then a uh, budget is not going to work as well. It's going to fail, all right? So uh, the first thing that every budget 
has to have is money to budget. Uh, this is the same thing with any business. A business needs to have revenue in order to budget for all the other things it needs to function. So look for things you can do to generate more income. Now, if you are already set and you're doing very well, making a lot of money, more power to you, uh, we can skip over this part for you. But for those of you who are not, you don't own a home yet because you haven't been able to save money, well, it may not be because of your budget. It may be just because you don't make enough money. So look for things you can do to generate more income. Uh, the first thing you can do to position yourself uh, to generate income is to stop watching television. So the time you spend in the evening watching TV, uh, you could be doing something to make money, something online uh, to make money or something part time to make money. Or if you have a job where you can work overtime, you can do that to make money. Now, uh, when you are just getting started, uh, I don't believe in this uh, balance, this idea of balance. It's, it's really just a theory. It's not reality. Now, there's no balance when you are broke. You're supposed to be out of balance, so you can fix that. Uh, there is no balance when you don't have any money in the bank. There is no balance. I'm just sorry. I, I realize that you want to have balance in your life. You want to have time for this and time for that. But unfortunately, you have to earn balance. Balance is earned by having enough money and money in the bank, by earning enough money every month, every day, and have enough money in the savings, you, you're in a position now to purchase balance. Balance is not a right. Balance is something you buy. That's what balance is. So don't fall for these uh, psycho gurus out there who talk about balance. They can only talk about balance because they have lots of money and time to have balance. When you don't have money, you don't have time. You don't, right? If you're not earning enough money, then you don't have time because you have to do other things to earn more money. So make more money. That's the first thing you do. It's the top, it's the first thing that you look at on any budget or any profit and loss, and that is the gross income, the revenue coming in. So work a part-time job if possible. Leverage your talents and skills on Upwork, Fiverr. There's all kinds of online platforms that you can do things. You get a great writer, write someone's resume, edit their school paper, edit uh, for a magazine, uh, write copy for a radio show, uh, drive Uber. I know so many people doing Uber. I mean, when I'm traveling, I see a lot of older people doing Uber and younger people. I mean, there's no age limit. And, and as they tell me, it's great money. They're doing well. They're doing well. You can be a shopper. You know, we stop, we still go to the grocery store, store every now and then. But uh, most of the times now, we're ordering our groceries and a driver brings our groceries from the store, Instacart, um, house cleaning, janitorial services, babysitting, tutoring, your math whiz, you know, you can tutor. You can use this very platform, Zoom, share screens. You can tutor people all over the world. If you're really smart in something, writing, history, math, homework, you know, what parents, everybody's working two jobs. You know, both parents are working. They hardly have time to spend with their kids and help with their homework. Put yourself out there as a tutor online. Translating, you speak Spanish, German, French, another language, translate. I tell you, a good friend of mine, he has a book, um, Paul, oh man, uh, Paul, his name is coming to his name is Paul, but he has a book entitled, It is Impossible to Be Poor in America. He's from Cameroon, Africa, came here um, by way of China, speaks Chinese, and uh, grew up extremely poor and uh, came to the land of opportunity, America. Uh, and uh, wrote a book called It's Impossible to Be Poor in America. I did a radio show. In fact, if you just type into our search in the radio uh, platform, go to uh, blogtalkradio.com forward slash the powers now, type in It's Impossible to Be Poor, and you'll find the interview. Paul LaJoy, that's his name. In fact, you can Google Paul 
LeJoy, L-E-J-O-Y, put him in Amazon, check out his book, it's a great read, and you can also listen to his uh, interview. But talk about someone who does what it takes, who did what it takes, and still does, he's now today a successful real estate broker, uh, speaker, author, uh, very, very, very proud of Paul LeJoy. Point is, you can do something to make more money. Now, you're making more money, time to save more money. So uh, make or create something that you can uh, save or that you can sell, that is. So you want to sell something? Um, uh, I like poetry. In fact, I have two poetry books that are coming out very soon. And uh, they're going to be, they're not gift books. It is my, 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 uh, my, my sweat, the sweat of my brow, uh, putting my best efforts to create some very, I uh, say, creative poetry, spiritual poetry, family poetry. Uh, I, I'm hoping that you'll love it and that you will buy it. It will be on Amazon. It will be on Amazon. And I can't wait to, for it to come out. So create something. You know, maybe you're an artist. I have a niece, Lauren, who is an incredible artist. In fact, her husband, I, I tell you, they both can paint and draw like nobody's business. Uh, I, I've already told them they should get us, you know, get a website, take pictures of it, sell the lithographs, sell the original artwork. I mean, you may have a talent or skill that uh, you can do that can generate more money. And because that is extra money, you can start saving, start building up your savings. You can become a consultant uh, in your area of expertise. Like I'm a business consultant. I consult with people on a number of different things. That's extra money for me. Uh, you can start an emergency fund immediately. When you are doing these extra things uh, that are beyond your normal income and salary, all right? Uh, saving money comes after paying the rent or the mortgage, all right? That's what it comes. I mean, you gotta keep a roof over your head. And then after that, you got to put money away. And then after that, you can start paying bills. If rent is too high, then you've got to downsize. You've got to look for a cheaper apartment. You got to downsize the mortgage because saving money is your number one priority. Let me tell you something. The number one reason reason, the number one reason why people have bad credits because they don't have any money. I'm I'm a living witness to this. If I've ever experienced any financial troubles, because I literally run out of money. And when you run out of money, you can't pay bills, right? And then next thing you know, you have late coming up on your car, credit cards and mortgages. That's, that's the number one reason why people have bad credit, because they don't have any money. And they don't have any money, and the number one reason why they don't have any money is because they don't have a budget. It's really not because they don't make enough money. I want to say it's because they don't make enough money, but that should be a focus of making more money, but they're not managing the money they make. And so uh, you have to make saving money your number one priority. So how do you save money? 20% of your net income goes into your savings account. 20%, he says, oh my God, Eric, how am I going to do that? Who does that, right? Well, um, there are a lot of people doing it. They make enough money where they're able to save a lot of money. They haven't increased their expenses. Most people will raise their expenses to meet their income, right? And so instead of reducing their expenses as their income goes up, they keep raising their expenses as their income goes up. We all do it. We all do it. I mean, I've done it. I don't know anyone who hasn't done that, especially if you grew up poor. You know, I mean, I grew up extremely poor. I'm the oldest of seven in a 600 square foot house in San Bernardino, California. Uh, lights constantly being turned off, not having enough food. I mean, I could go on and on. And so when you make it out of that and you started making good money, the first thing you want to do is buy a fancy car, a bunch of whole nice, whole, a whole lot of nice suits and spend as much money uh, because you haven't had it before, you're not even used to it. And so all you know is to spend, 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 and to kind of relive your childhood of not having anything, not having money. 
until it's all gone. And then you realize that you are your parents and you're running out of money, not having enough money to even meet the necessities. And that's a, that's, 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 it's a vicious cycle of poverty. It's a mindset. It's a mindset. And so making money a priority, saving money a priority means that it, it's, it's number one, you're gonna pay the rent. And then after that, or pay the mortgage, after that, you're gonna set aside 20%. In fact, I would say you just set aside 20% and then you pay the rent and the mortgage. That's really what you should do. So when you get set up, you know, to like, I just went to some, I've gone to two graduations so far. I think I'm done with graduations. And I've seen all these kids graduating with full of hope and promise and they're gonna go, some are gonna to go to grad school, some are gonna go start their new jobs. And you know what they're going to do. The first thing, they're going to get this job starting 50, 60, 70, 100,000 dollars a year, depending on what they do. And you know what they're going to do. The first thing they're going to do is go buy an expensive car, 600 dollars a month, their dream car. And then they're going to go get an expensive apartment, you know, living where everything is. So downtown, you're looking at 2,500 dollars a month. And they just become crazy with just living the life, and uh, they're too immature to think about. Uh, the future. And so uh, they end up, they make all these, uh, what they think are smart moves, because you know, young people think they're smarter than everybody else. They make all these smart moves and eventually it catches up with them. Now they're in debt to their neck. They have student loan debts to pay, plus car payments, plus credit cards, plus high rent. Now they're not even in a position to buy a home. So uh, for you young people who might be listening tonight, don't do that. You know, uh, just start thinking now, when you get that job, when you start making money right off the bat, stay home for as long as you can with your parents, for as long as you can put up with them, all right, or they can put up with you, and start just stacking the cash, stacking cash, so that you can really live according to this rule. If you move out and you start saving, you did right off the top, 20% of your net income is going into savings and investments, you will be so far ahead of the game in five years, even a year from now, you'll realize uh, what a great decision that is. So the result of this category may affect your ability to pay all of your expenses, which that simply means that you have too many expenses. You haven't made um, saving money a priority. The emergency fund is so important too. It has to be you know, uh, part of that, uh, the first thing you're trying to achieve when you're saving money 20% around at the top. And so if you don't have an emergency fund, then you need to secure credit uh, to help establish that, right? And having good credit uh, is the beginning of wealth. And I believe in using credit cards to establish an emergency fund to be used for emergencies, not used for consumer spending. And so when you're able to do that, uh, you are now just, uh, you're set temporarily until you have achieved enough money uh, in your savings account to where you don't need to see this credit as an emergency fund, but now it's just um, uh, representative of your, of your good uh, budgetary uh, uh, spending and management. And um, you might be able to use it at some point in the future to reward yourself, perhaps. Uh, I'm not saying credit is a bad thing, but improperly used, it can be a bad thing. So uh, one of the things you can do to, uh, you know, empower your budget uh, and to save more money is to eliminate your car payment. Now, if you just bought the car, you already know you probably can't take it back, but you should try anyway. You just never know. You never know. If you can get out of it, please get out of it. Uh, if you're spending anywhere near anything over $250 a month for a car payment, uh, it's probably too much car. The car payment should not be more than 10% of your net income. 10% of your net income, your cash flow. Forget about your gross, nobody lives on their gross. So if you're netting $3,000 a month net income, then you can afford a car payment of about $300 a month. Now that's if you absolutely need a car payment. You don't really need a car payment. You can buy a car for two to $3,000 used at an auction. Just go to the auction, pay cash. 
um, you can do that. There'll be an American made car with at least 100,000 miles on it. Take it to a dealer or to a mechanic, get it checked out and, and leverage that resource for as long as you can until you're able to save more money and buy a newer model, uh, all cash. Try to avoid financing cars at all expense. All it does is it reduces your purchasing power in buying a house. It reduces your ability to save money. And it's, it's just, it's never a good idea. It's never a good idea to finance a vehicle. Another thing is to stop your 401k. The 401k is, you know, it, it sounds great, but it's really not great. It's really not great. When you think about it, uh, why would you intentionally put your money into a vehicle that you can't have access to unless, uh, number one, you borrow it, and, you, and if you have to borrow it, you have to pay it back. Uh, otherwise, uh, it, there are other penalties associated with that. You can pull it out, but because you're putting in pre-tax dollars, there's a 10% penalty for pulling it out, and you have to pay the tax rate you're trying to avoid anyway. Uh, here's the thing, you don't do a 401k until you have your emergency fund established. Because what happens is people who have 401ks, they don't have any emergency funds established whatsoever in a checking or money market, something easily accessible to that's after tax dollars. They have no emergency funds. Something happens, now they have to borrow against their 401k. That's another debt, it comes right out of their paycheck, now they're taking home less money. Or if they take the money out, they're going to have to take out an additional 10% more than they need to cover the penalty they have to pay. And on top of that, now that income, whatever they took out, is going to be reported to the IRS and they have to pay taxes on it. It doesn't make sense to have a 401k when you do not have an emergency fund. A 401k is for retirement. You don't start your retirement fund until you have built your emergency fund. Everybody I know that has ever done that has ended up having to access a retirement fund or their 401k to do everything from buying a home to helping with a funeral to getting you know out of trouble so it's not a smart move the next thing is eliminate premium cable tv stop watching tv start reading more um, now there's a great deal of debate about this a lot of people are getting watching tv online saving a lot of money from those three, four hundred dollar cable bills, now they're paying maybe a hundred bucks, subscribing to ABC and BC and all the other channels directly. There are ways to save money on that, to do that. And I tell you, with you know, you have YouTube TV now, and you have everybody's becoming their own television. Hey, you have the powers now TV, we're free. But everybody's becoming their own TV plan, you know, and uh, uh, so look for the cost of accessing premium shows and cable and entertainment to continue to drop, but uh, look for ways to eliminate that altogether. I know you can do it. Eliminate gym memberships, go to the park, run or walk. And you say, wow, man, Eric, now you're really being ridiculous. I love my gym membership. I am not about to give that up. Well, how often do you go? Once a month, once every quarter, once a year? Do you go every day? If you're going to the gym every day and you're really serious about it, then maybe this is something you should continue to do. But you really got to weigh the cost to the benefits. I mean, could you get with a, aren't there other more inexpensive ways to lose weight? Can you form a group in your neighborhood or with your friends, work out in somebody's garage or at home gym? You know, have you thought about investing in building a gym in your home? You know, you may be an empty nester now, you got another room in the house, get a gym set, a few hundred dollars, you've got a universal gym for maybe a grand. I mean, you're spending $70, $80 a month, that's a grand a year. And five years, you've cut a, you could have the top of the line equipment that anyone could ever want to need in your own gym, right? Coley paid for itself. But you know, maybe you don't like working out by yourself. I know I have a gym, I hate working out by myself. And as a result, I don't work out as much as I should, but I'm not spending money on gym memberships. Stop buying coffee at Starbucks. Start, stop eating fast food. It's bad for you. Uh, it's giving you heart disease and high blood pressure. Take public transportation whenever possible. The train, whenever possible. 
These are things that you can do to save money. Start packing the lunch, cook it at home, start, stop buying clothes and jewelry and, and jewelry and shoes you don't need. Limit your entertainment to once a month, you know, or look for more inexpensive ways to entertain yourself. Uh, stop paying monthly for any type of internet program or service. That's a big one right now. Some people are, are just very techy and they sign up for everything, right? Uh, cut up your credit cards, except for the one that you will use mostly that has maybe the largest limit. Do not close them. Just cut them up so they're not accessible. You don't want to close a credit card. It will affect your, your FICO score. Eliminate a department store. You do not need a department store card, period. You do not need them at all. Uh, stop using your credit cards as income replacements. Uh, all you're doing is running up debt. Stop paying off collection accounts and charge-offs and other derogatory credit. I mean, it's already on your credit report. It's, uh, you've already been impacted. Your score's already been affected. The deal is done, right? And so now they become, unless they're trying to sue you and drag you into court, they become your lowest priority. Absolutely your lowest priority. One of the things we do when we're working with people to build their credit, the first thing they want to do is start paying off those collections. I'm saying forget about those people for a minute. Unless you've been served and you're going to court, forget about it. Focus on building your reserves. The reason you have collection accounts right now is because you don't have any money in the bank. So that's what's going to be our priorities. We're going to set a goal for saving money. And once we've achieved that goal, then we're going to start working on paying down or paying off or selling the collection debt. That's how you're supposed to do it, folks. That's how it works. Then you have the essential expense line items that you have to have. You know, we all need life insurance, disability insurance, renter's insurance, health insurance, car insurance. Uh, we got to take care of our house, you know, for those who own a home. You know, we got to, certain things you got to do, you got to paint, you got to replace things, you got to do things. And so these are essential line out of expenses that you need to budget for. You got to have dental insurance, car maintenance, taking care of the car, right? The reason why a lot of people go buy a new car is because they don't take care of the car they have. Now they're forced, they think they're forced to buy a new car. They want something, quote, more reliable. I was at a car show the other day, and I saw 1930, 40, 50, 60 cars, classics. I mean, they start up the engine. Those things are purring like kittens. Those cars are absolutely gorgeous. I mean... You don't have to have, you know, a 19, you know, 58, 60 Camaro all tricked out and laid out to take care of it. You can have a, a 2007 Ford uh, something or Toyota something with 100,000 miles on it. And it is beautiful, well-maintained, taken care of, just like the guys do with those old cars that they bring to the classic car shows. So this whole idea that I wanna buy something reliable, something that I can count on, that's a bunch of crap. It is, it's just an excuse to buy a car and to go in debt thousands of dollars, pay more money than you should pay for the car in the first place. So think about it. Um, you need to take care of your lawn, you need to, Pay your taxes, get your taxes um, uh, filed, uh, pay your car registration. And uh, uh, those are things, those are kind of the essentials that we need to have in the budget. So some of the mistakes that people make, and I'm coming to an end here, not estimating how much you spend, forgetting to save for the unexpected expenses, uh, having unrealistic expectations about the budget, uh, budgeting based on your gross income, and, you know, nobody lives in their gross, not considering uh, cheaper alternatives, you know, you don't really have to have the brand for everything, really. Buying too much house, you're on a champagne taste, beard budget, get in where you fit in. Instead of buying a single family home with a payment you can hardly afford, why not buy a four unit building and not have a payment at all, all right? That's what I'm talking about not tracking your expenses, neglecting emergency planning, forgetting to allow for non-reoccurring expenses in your budget, 
things that happen maybe once a year, not expecting the really bad stuff to happen, which is why we don't pay attention to the emergency fund, not budgeting your top resource, and that is time to really sit down and look at your finances and what you're doing. That is your most precious resource time. And owing too many people, too many uh, credit cards, you don't need more than two or three. You know, too many loans, how many too many obligations out there? And then, you know, spreading yourself too thin. Now I'm preaching to the choir there. I do a lot of stuff. I need to cut out some things. Never adjusting your variable expenses, forgetting to balance your checkbook. Let me say that again. Forgetting to balance your checkbook. Not using a budgeting software, right? And we have one tonight I want to introduce to you called Mint.com. And then trying to keep up with your friends. Forget about your friends. I mean, let your friends be real friends. You know, they accept they accept you for who you are. Broke, no money, trying to save, get your life together to buy a house one day. That's who you are, right? You need friends who accept you who you are, not trying to fake it like they've made it when they have it. Spending money they don't have to show off. You don't really need that. And you don't really need friends like that if, if that's what they're all about. Dictating the family budget. And if you're married, you know, it's got to be a consensus. Your wife has to be all in on it. You know, you can't be going in one direction and she's going in the other. Uh, stealing money from others, you know, like the kids' college funds and, and your emergency fund. And, um, you know, you just, you know, once you start these savings programs, you got to stick with it. Depriving yourself of fun money, all right? You can't be all work and no play. Just limit the play. All right. And thinking you don't need a budget, which is why most people don't have a budget. That is a serious budget mistake. So I'm going to share one tool with you, then we're going to end the show. And that is um, having a budget. You can use an Excel spreadsheet uh, that will break everything down, your income and the expenses. So you can project your income and then record what your actual income was. You can project your expenses what the expenses are and record what your actual expenses were. And um, there are many uh, on Microsoft Office, Excel, there are many budgets you can get for free that have these beautiful graphs built in. You don't even have to be an Excel expert to do this. Or you can go to mint.com and that's what I use. I use mint.com. I also use um, a QuickBooks, which is part of the Intuit family. And so everything is kind of combined. I'm able to see my expenses, where I'm at to the very day. I, in fact, I was looking at it today and seeing where I am in my budget and all the areas, everything. I love the graphics that they provide. It's a wonderful tool. I highly recommend it for everybody to use. The power budget, folks. We've gone about 27 minutes past time here, but I hope it was worth it. If you're interested in getting a budget, getting set up, getting help, go to neverrunagain.com and we can help you do it. If you're interested in buying a home and you want to get started, you can go to Apply to Buy Now or Never Lease Again. Apply to Buy Now is our application website. Never Lease Again is our application website. Get started tonight. Learn what your FICO score is and uh, get pre-approved to buy a home. Uh, I certainly hope that you appreciate the information that I've shared with you tonight. This is the power budget. The power is now budget plan. And um, if you would like uh, more help or more assistance, go to Never Rent Again, sign up for our, our Home Buyers Club and schedule an appointment to meet with me and I will help you for free get all these things set up. And then if you want coaching, then that's up to you you can sign up for our coaching program and be held accountable to achieve your budgetary goals, your savings goals, your credit goals, every all the goals until you are in a position to buy a home. We would love to do that for you. Well, uh, this has been um, time well spent. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Uh, for those of you who have been hanging there with me with uh, Facebook and on Block Talk Radio, thank you so much for uh, being on the show tonight. And if you have any questions about anything, uh, please let me know. Uh, eating out, Ebony, you're absolutely right. Eating out and splurging is everybody's issue. It is everybody's issue. Uh, who doesn't like to eat out? I'm heading to Oakland tomorrow, 
and I'm going to have a good old time hitting up some soul food restaurants and what have you, but I'm not going to overdo it. I've already budgeted for my travel when I travel, all right? So I've already budgeted. <laughs> If you are interested in uh, getting any kind of help with this, you know, I, I, I feel you on this. I've been there. I can help you. If you want to uh, get started with buying a home, uh, I can help you with that tonight. Kel Wright, uh, if you need to buy a home, reach out to me. I'm teaching realtors how to qualify for a home purchase. I'm teaching consumers how to qualify for a home purchase. Anybody who wants to learn how to buy a home, uh, I can show you how to do it, how to buy a single family home, duplex, triplex, fourplex, with no money down, how to qualify as a first time home buyer. We can find programs that require no down payment like USDA, VA, or programs where you can get uh, a grant for the down payment like Cal FHA and the My Home and Zip down payment help and credit costs, uh, closing costs help, or FHA and the various down payment assistance programs that will give you the money, the three and a half percent that's required for an FHA loan. All of these things are available. As a broker, we have it all folks. We have everything you need to make it happen. So for those of you who are watching on Facebook, if you have any questions, please reach out to me. Uh, you can drop me an email, you can inbox me on Facebook, uh, go to eric.fraser.powersnow.com. For those of you who are on Blog Talk Radio, please watch the video. That you can see the Power presentation, PowerPoint presentation on Facebook. Go to facebook.com forward slash the power is now. Please check out our magazine. Go to thepowersnow.com and look under uh, the homepage of the magazine. Uh, we're celebrating Juneteenth and, um, and other great articles that are there for your consideration. Well, that concludes the evening. Thank you, Sylvia Young, for being online with me tonight. Uh, Sylvia is an agent for The Powers Now, broker agent out of Berkeley, California. Leon Townsend out of Pasadena, power agent for The Powers Now team. And um, we have others that are listening and are participating. We appreciate your participation tonight. Please share the link, I would appreciate it. Uh, like on the show uh, and uh, tell others about it. Every Tuesday night, we're right here on Facebook Live and on Blog Talk Radio. Please tune in uh, with us on next, uh, this coming Thursday, where we'll be doing the Powers Now marketing session. And uh, this week, we'll be talking about commercial real estate, although we may switch because I have a special guest that will be handling the show. Uh, Danan will be handling the show, Danan Burnside, our co-host of the Power is Now marketing session. So he may choose to deal with residential real estate as opposed to commercial real estate. We'll let him make that decision, but we will be having a marketing session on Thursday from 12.30 to 1.30. And if you're interested in pitching your property for sale, just reach out to us. You can join us live on the Zoom platform and uh, communicate what you have for sale or maybe what your buyers may need. Uh, to uh, our audience on Thursday from 12.30 to 1.30. Well, remember, we are at our best and we maximize our success when we act now. Thank you for joining us this evening on The Powers Now Facebook Live First Time Home Buyer Seminar. I appreciate your attendance. Have a wonderful evening. See you soon right here on Thursday on The Powers Now marketing session. Have a great evening, everyone. Talk to you soon.